the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry, celebrating 60 years of empirical research, clinical studies, and systematic reviews. For details of our 60th anniversary celebrations, visit www.acamh.org slash jcpp60. Follow us on Twitter with the handle at the JCPP and use the hashtag JCPP60. Now we are here. Great. Well, um, yeah, what an incredible honor to be involved in marking the 60th anniversary uh, of the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry. And before I start, I'd say, like to say a few thank yous, actually. Uh, first of all, of course, to Prabha and the team for putting on such a great uh, event with a, a wonderful cast uh, of speakers. Um, I'd like to thank Eric for actually some really good ideas that we've got to think about at the journal, but also, of course, for your contribution, uh, enormous contribution as a former editor, which also gives me the chance to thank all the former editors uh, here. Um, <laughs> who you know, continue to inspire the current editorial uh, group. Uh, you are the shoulders that we are standing on. So that, thank you very, very much. <laughs> and finally, I, I'd like to thank Kathy as the president, uh, Stephen as the chair, and Martin Pratt as the CEO of ACAM for their unswerving support of the journal and their confidence in me uh, as an editor-in-chief. So thank you very much. <laughs> so it is a great opportunity today to celebrate the enormous contribution to evidence-based and science-driven progress in child and adolescent uh, psychology and psychiatry of the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry. But it's also an occasion to take stock um, where have we got to as a journal, and what are our next steps as a journal? And for sure, the next few years are not going to be boring with regard to that. So radical new plans supported by very powerful and influential bodies, let's be frank, would like uh, to do away with uh, hybrid-funded journals like the JCPP, um, and replace them with a fully open access uh, publishing model. Now, this will change or could change uh, the publishing landscape almost completely in the next five years. And, and very few journals will be immune to the upheaval and the uncertainty that this is going to bring. No matter the status of the journal or its state, and you know, the JCBP is in rude health. As you'll, as you'll see. So we're well placed to deal with this. But we certainly can't be complacent. Um, we can't assume the things, the way we've done things in the past is the way they're going to be done in the future. Um, we can't even be sure that it would be possible to do them um, in that way in the future. But we're not going to throw up our hands in despair and give up, of course. In fact, our aim, was, we're determined to seize the opportunities that this period of flux will bring, both for the field, I think, and, and for the Journal of Child Psychiatry. So some have argued that the days of high added value journals like the JCPP, with strong production and strong scientific values and exacting editorial standards are numbered. Put out of business, by the growth of uh, utilitarian, lower cost, lower quality pay to publish, I'll call them platforms. Um, as funders, of course, want to reduce costs and cut margins. Now, we think that's 180 degrees wrong because we believe that authors will increasingly place a premium on journals with a pedigree where they can have complete trust in the offer that that journal brings, and where they know the journal will add value to their science. In a similar way, um, we believe that readers will 
even more than the, in the past, seek out those journals where they can be absolutely confident about the quality of the work and its veracity. So today is definitely about cherishing uh, our achievements, but I think it's also about looking, um, trying to learn from the way we've achieved those things. And so, um, to paraphrase one of my heroes and the great soul poet of the 20th century, Mr. Smokey Robinson, it's actually the way we do the things uh, we do that's really important. And I've got a to-do list, so do becomes quite important in this uh, talk. The first is what do we aim to do as a journal? What have we done as a journal and our achievements? How have we done those things? Where do the, what's the process by which we've achieved at those things? And what will we do next? And uh, I'll take you through those. So what we aim to do as a journal. Our mission statement uh, was, has been published in a number of editorials and a num number of other documents. But it was, it's been really important to formulate this really clearly uh, for the journal. I think perhaps at the behest of our publishers, Wiley Blackwell, a few years back. So obviously, first of all, our, our goal is to disseminate the very best basic and applied research in mental health and mental disorder and developmental disabilities that is available. And as part of that, of course, to promote science-driven and evidence-based approaches, uh, both uh, to inquiry, of course, but also uh, to clinical practice, to champion methodological rigor and theoretical innovation. And I think these have been two of the core pillars of the JCP's uh, brand since its inception, and it's what it's known for or has been known for in the past. We do aim to increase transparency, both of our own processes, so our decision processes, uh, and the way we make decisions, and uh, the processes uh, by which we come to those decisions are now almost completely transparent. But of course we want to increase the transparency of the authors that we publish, encourage them to be transparent about their processes, and so to increase repro reproducibility in the face of this reproducibility crisis that we are experiencing. And crucially, we want to maintain a balanced portfolio. And at various points in our history, there's been pressure to narrow, to go more, you know, become a more neuroscience journal, become a more genetics journal, become a, a more trials journal, you know, for, for kind of obvious reasons. But we, one of our defining features is the breadth of what we do. Um, from basic science to clinical practice and in, including clinical implementation from uh, a, across a range of disorders, a, a range of processes from the social to the biological. So this broad and balanced portfolio is a key defining feature of what we do. As Eric mentioned, we are trying really hard to make specialised and technical science accessible to clinicians. Uh, and also to non-specialist scientists uh, in the field. That is a, a goal. I think we're, we're doing okay, but I think there's further to go uh, with that. We are a truly international journal, and this is a core value for us in terms of our orientation, but also in terms of our values and the content of what we publish, which you'll see in a minute. And as part of that, on offshoot of that, we, we, we would like to play some role in trying to nurture research in less established individuals and groups. Never, of course, requiring dropping of standards, but just facilitating that publication process, perhaps for people who are less familiar with those processes. And crucially, and this is our offer, as I mentioned before, we want to be valued because of the excellence, the rigor, the efficiency, the fairness, the integrity, and the ethical values of our editorial decision-making processes. And I think JCPP has always been valued for those things. 
And as part of all that, in the context of the changes that are going to be happening, we want to be the number one choice in this increasingly dysregulated and, and competitive market. So that's our mission. What's not in our mission? So when people say, you say, oh, I'm an editor-in-chief of a journal, they say, well, which journal? I say, the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry. They don't ask me what the mission of the journal is. You know what they ask me? They say, what's the impact factor of the journal? But you probably notice that's not in our uh, mission statement. Uh, some people think of an impact factor as in terms of the holy grail, a high impact factor. That's what we're aiming for. In fact, it's much more likely that it plays the role of the sirens uh, dragging the good ship JCPP onto the rocks, potentially, if it's sought as an end in itself. We are, we are aware, of course, that authors and readers, impact factor is a proxy for the quality, the visibility, and the importance of their papers. So we can't ignore it. But from our point of view, it's more of an indication that we're doing the right things. So it's not an end in itself, but it tells us, yeah, we're doing the right. People are using our papers. Scientists are using our papers. And we know it drives author choice. So again, we can't ignore it, but it's not an end in itself. And the reason for that is simple, because it might distort our mission. And there have been points where we've had to think about this quite carefully. Being absolutely frank, it can encourage the editorial dark arts of impact factor manipulation. Although, of course, that wouldn't affect us. Uh, but more seriously for us, it could discourage publication of certain types of work. Uh, makes us more, might make us more conservative, less innovative, uh, narrower in scope, and um, perhaps favouring established authors over uh, less established authors. And so working against the development of the field and the generativ generativity in the field. So that's not part of our mission statement. So, so what have we done? Some of the things we've done. We certainly maintain a broad portfolio of research. So this is the word cloud that I generated uh, from uh, last three years. Titles, was it, Prava, you sent me? Last 10 years, my golly. Yeah. No wonder it took me ages to put them all in. Uh, right, OK. Uh, yeah, so you can see there, we, we cover pretty much everything. In every issue, you can see an enormous range of different areas, different disorders, different methodologies, different focuses, foci, and so forth. We do have widespread usage. This is the trajectory for the impact factor of the journal since 2004. And you can see our impact factor has pretty much doubled uh, over this time. But there is an interesting phenomena, which is um, widely now in the publication world, I hear, is to call the Chinooga Bark Effect. And uh, so you see a drop. You see, and when I started, there was an immediate drop as uh, Tony Charman handed over the, uh, the baton to me. But I, I, I gradually figured out what we were supposed to be doing, and you can see <laughs> that we improved. And crucially here, uh, obviously, the context is important, and this is the ranking of the journal. So we are now ranked first amongst all the developmental psychology and psychiatry journals uh, over that period. Um, another measure of usage, which Eric mentioned, is downloads. And so that's not usage by authors, but it's usage by readers, perhaps clinicians, students. And so we have seen an enormous increase in downloads. So we've hit a million downloads uh, now, I think, in 2018. Um, so that's another important uh, metric. So we might have uh, reached asymptote in terms of impact factor. It'd be hard to go much higher, I think. But certainly in terms of other usages, we're, we're working on that broadening that usage. Um, in terms of global reach, it's interesting that in the last three years, and this is crucial, and very interesting, I guess, for the people on the, web, uh, the webcam, that in the last three years, authors from 49 different countries have published in the JCPP. And you can see the breakdown across the different countries. Um, uh, so this is the last three years, the majority from North America, certainly Britain, but you can see people from Africa, Latin America, Southern Europe, the Far East, and so forth and so on. So very broad family, if you like, for the JCPP. Uh, just focusing on these three areas, because you'll see they vary in relation to my next slide. So that's Scandinavia, Australia, and New Zealand, uh, and the Far East, which includes Japan and China and so forth. 
So the next slide then is the global reach in terms of readership. So in the last three years, uh, there have been more than 1,000 downloads in 73 different countries. Again, data supplied by Prava. And so there's the breakdown again. Many, a lot of it looks a bit similar to the authorship. So I, I don't think it's just that the authors are getting their families to download the... Well, that, that is a hypothesis you haven't tested, so probably ought to look into that. Uh, uh, but I just highlight these three because they're in a different order than on the authorship one. And it just highlights the really increase in, in interest in the JCPP and mental health in the Far East in particular. China and, and Japan has really grown as a, as a consumer of our work. Now, we do have some markets we're trying to break into. Um, and so over the, last, over the last three years, oh, it gets better, don't worry. Over the last three years, uh, we have one download in the Vatican City. Now, that was such an auspicious occasion, we in fact sent a photographer. <laughs> <laughs> along as Holy Father um, uh, was uh, uh, doing a ceremonial download uh, of a paper from JCPP. And uh, I was, we asked what it was about, and he said he had to find that Pasco Fear on editorial, partly because he was trying to work out what the title meant. <laughs> so, so we're also uh, very active on social media. Uh, there are metrics patterns across time. Uh, across a range of different, you can't probably, or you could probably read them better than me actually on there, but we've got blogs, tweets, and so So we're still very active. And if you just cut that little bit out the bottom, so the bottom timeline is since, I don't know, it looks like about 1800, but it can't be. <laughs> probably, yeah. Anyway, so you can see an enormous increase in activity. And I'd just like to highlight this gentleman who you probably might have met today. So Matt is our guru on the social media and brilliant at getting the exposure for, for the journal. I think uh, uh, he's been superb for us in getting at, at raising our profile. We're also mentioned uh, in the, uh, policy uh, work considerably. So in uh, 2018, we had um, 68 uh, policy mentions. These are some of the, the uh, reports. And right across the world, certainly not just in the UK. Uh, I'm not going to obviously run through them all. So how do we get there? How do we uh, achieve uh, what we've achieved in terms of the reach of the work and the usage of the work and, and the influence of the work? Well, I'm a great believer in virtuous, creating virtuous uh, cycles. And in our virtuous cycle, in at least the recent virtuous cycle, the, the hab I think yeah, it's a tr probably a tri or qu qu cyclical journal, but this cycle, was establishing the multi-editor model. And so I would just like to highlight these three visionary people. Um, I don't know if Jim Stevenson's here, but I know Frankie's here, obviously, because he's going to speak. Uh, and Frank Verhurst, I don't think, is here. But they were the three editors, and I think it was around 2003. And they had this incredibly good idea to actually uh, appoint, uh, I think it was seven editors, to the next round rather than three, and to identify editor-in-chief. Um, and that meant, of course, apart from dividing the workload, that meant, of course, um, getting close to these specialist areas, knowing your area, knowing the authors, uh, knowing the reviewers. Now, that's, a, that's quite a challenge, as people know. So it was a great idea. And I think we owe, the, actually, these three people an awful lot for, for that idea. The second stage in the virtuous model is, of course, you've got the model, you've got to appoint the editors. So you need to appoint great editors. And I actually think that's the most important thing the editor-in-chief does, is, is work with the other editors to identify new people and then persuade them to take on this job, because it's a big job. And we do have, oh, sorry, and also create a great publications team. Sorry. And we do have a great publications team. Uh, I think probably the best in the world, I should imagine. Uh, we do have wonderful editors. So just highlight Pasco Firon, who's a deputy editor-in-chief, and these are our, our review editors. I'm not going to go through all of the names, because you'll see it's a lot of people. And then we have thematic editors. So for instance, neuroscience, molecular genetics, behavioral genetics, statistics. So I mean, just look at the people we have. I mean, how can you not enjoy working with these wonderful people uh, and be inspired by working with them? And then we have condition-specific editors. So in total we have 20 editors, plus me 21 editors now. Uh, and I have 
to say it works wonderfully, and it's a great privilege to lead, lead these wonderful uh, scientists and colleagues. The second stage then, of course, is to put the people in place and then work tirelessly to improve your offer and the reputation of the journal. And one of the things people care about most is how quickly you can make decisions. And so this is a pattern showing the changes in our decision times uh, over the last period. And it is a testament uh, to the efficiency of the office, to the industry and expertise of the editors, uh, and also to uh, the multi-editor system, but also to a, 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 I suppose a, a tactical, you might say, almost dignify it with strategic a decision uh, in, a, in about... Uh, 2009, 2010, where we decided to introduce a much stronger triage system, where we now triage about 50% of papers in the first two or three days. Um, and uh, that is the editor-in-chief's responsibility uh, in consultation with the other editors. Um, but even without the, the, those triage papers, we are around 33 days for our average decision time. So it is, it is, And again, I don't think we can get quicker than that without losing the quality. And this is our offer we make now. We, we offer, we, our main thing is we will get the decision back to you within 60 days at the most. And we hit that 95% of the times now. And so that's what we're really pushing for. Yeah, I'm okay for fine. So, work tirelessly. That, of course, then, I don't know if people can, yeah, you can see it better than me again, increases the number and quality of submissions, increases the reach and the impact of our papers. That, of course, makes it easier then to appoint great editors. Um, uh, and we do have two new editors. Uh, we have Scott Collins from Duke University, who's taken over from Jeff Halperin for ADHD. And we have Helen Fisher from King's College London, who's taken over from Chris Hollis on psychosis. They've just both started. And we have two, uh, we're looking for two, two people at the moment, uh, one in emotional disorders and then one in molecular genetics. And then, of course, that the whole thing goes round again, and this is the virtuous cycle I think we've created. So what will we do next? Uh, as I said, it's going to be a very interesting next few years. Um, we are thinking about the developmental scope of the journal, thinking about whether to extend the traditional um, boundaries, ad childhood, adolescent, into emerging adulthood, perhaps moving our upper boundary to 22, 23, as a, as, a, as, a, as a range. We are always looking to broaden our editorial expertise and the areas, even with that core nucopia of talent, there are areas where we don't have expertise uh, and we may appoint further specialist editors. We're looking as, um, I think Stephen mentioned, that we're looking to work with ACAM to influence policy through evidence. Um, and we have set up a, a strategic, I don't I can't remember what it's called, Stephen, but it's something like strategic policy committee, which I am a member of. Uh, and that the idea there is, and, and looking to appoint strategic policy officers to work together to try and have an influence outside the normal scope of our influence. To, uh, not mentioned it yet, to address the reproducibility crisis. We are, this is obviously very actively uh, in our thoughts, as it is in all journal thoughts, we have decided not to go to um, the uh, uh, registered report model for the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry. We don't think that's our best role, uh, given the availability of registration platforms uh, more widely. We do now demand uh, registration of all randomized trials, whether or not they're clinical trials. We will be requiring registration of all reviews, uh, although that's going to take a little bit of time to, to shape up. Uh, and then we're also going to implement uh, some, this was discussed actually simply just actually yesterday in an editorial meeting, uh, we, we, we agreed to implement some sort of way of getting people to record uh, a record of, of, of initial hypotheses uh, and statistics plans, uh, either on supplementary information or, or in some other way. And we've got to respond to this open access revolution. You could have, some might put crisis too there, but we'll call it revolution. Um, there's so much uncertainty, many discussions between funders 
uh, and uh, journals and publishers and professional associations because it's actually those associations that are probably going to be hit hardest by the finances of, of this. Um, uh, but the bottom line, and it is actually a bottom line in this, in this sense, is that the unit, co the unit cost, the unit price per article is almost certain to be reduced quite significantly over the next few years, no matter what solution is come up with, which will inevitably have major consequences for ACAM, um, given that we are a major source of income for ACAM. And so we are working to find creative solutions uh, that on the one hand do not uh, undermine the value of our brand, which of course is, is the most important thing to us, and the quality of what we do, uh, while still trying to um, uh, mitigate against those financial problems that they, that could bring to the association. So very quickly, uh, just a, two or three upcoming uh, highlights from the journal. So we have, and great to see uh, Mike here, we have a virtual issue uh, that celebrates Mike's contribution to the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry. And Mike probably knows this, but I guess not many other people in the room know this, is he actually has published 99 papers in the Journal of Child Psychology <laughs> and Psychiatry over the years. And so this special virtual issue, we invited all the editors to identify papers that influenced them. And uh, then they wrote a, a commentary, and then Pasco and I have written a, an overall editorial. We did have the old thesaurus out looking for more and more superlatives. It was, it was, uh, it was fun to write, for sure. Um, but what we really struck by, actually, is that we only really covered about 60% of Mike's the influence he's had on the field. So we're going to have a volume two, probably. So you might receive an email asking for a comment. Uh, we've got the annual research review, which is, as mentioned, Eric mentioned it, I think, previously, and uh, coming up in April. Again, this really gives a sense of the scope of what we do. I mean, there are stuff on basic neuroscience right the way through to implementation science and everything in between. And then finally, I'd just like to give a plug to a very special, uh, spe a very special, special issue, <laughs> special issue squared, uh, on self-harm and, sub, uh, and uh, suicide, that Joan Azanar, who, as you know, is a, a world-leading expert on suicide and one of our editors, and Dennis Ugren, who is the editor of CAM, have put together, and this is absolutely a stellar uh, piece of work, so I think it'll have a, a defining influence on that field uh, as we go forward. So, yeah, thank you very much. To be part of the advancement of child and adolescent mental health, visit www.acamh.org.